After significant success in Russia, including uh, designing the world's first successful multi-motored aircraft, the Grand, at the advanced age of 23, he became, I, I would say honestly, in Russia. Before the revolution, he had a company that combine, would today be the equivalent of combining maybe Boeing and Douglas together and they were building a number of fighter aircraft of Igor Sikorsky's design and also the big four engine aircraft. All of this came to an end with the revolution and Igor Sikorsky then immigrated to the United States after a brief stop in France. In the United States, he uh, literally came very close to starvation, lived in a $12 a month flop house in Manhattan, and made life, uh, made ends meet by lecturing to Russian refugees on mathematics and physics. And eventually uh, a number of these refugees came to him and said, Mr. Sikorsky, we believe in you. We will volunteer labor work, Mondays, uh, evenings, uh, weekends, design and build us an airplane. I was born in New York City. I was born in 1925 and uh, I would say fell in love with aviation at a very early age. I don't know why, but I always had a fascination with aircraft. Well, already when I was six or eight years of age, I was building little model airplanes. Some flew, some didn't. And uh, I, the thing that really turned me on was a flight that I had seated on the lap of my father in an S-38. And I must have been about seven or eight years old at that time. The vision, the impression of going down the seaplane ramp in Stratford onto the river and the wind was favorable so we took off straight down the river into Long Island Sound. I began to see Long Island suddenly not as a thin line on the horizon from Connecticut but suddenly I began to see it three-dimensional. You began to see the thing tilt, you began to see houses. The flight lasted possibly 20 minutes, 30 minutes but when I landed I knew Someday, I would be a pilot. Not only was I in love with aviation, but I had the privilege of sort of sitting in in a quiet corner and listening. Visitors that included such names as Charles and Ann Lindbergh for many, many years. Uh, Roscoe Turner was a personal friend of Dad's from the Roosevelt Field days, and uh, he was often in the house and uh, Clarence Chamberlain, I remember, and, well, uh, very, very many. Some of the people that were also terribly romantic, uh, a m husband and wife couple, Martin and Osa Johnson, and they actually f uh, purchased an S-38 and an S-39 amphibian and flew all over Africa with it. When they came back with a terrific film, which was uh, released, they then uh, sold the S-38, kept the S-39, brought it down to Stratford, and during the overhaul of the aircraft, they promised me that the next time they went on an African safari for one year, if I wanted to, I could come with them. Dad was in favor, Mom was violently against Unfortunately, never came to pass because that same fall uh, they crashed in a TWA DC-3 on their way for, uh, to California. She survived, he died. And that, that offer was uh, unfortunately no longer valid. In the late 1930s, obviously, first of all, I had uh, <clears throat> the chance 
to visit the factory from time to time as the last of the great Sikorsky flying boats, the clipper ships, were being delivered to Pan Am. And uh, also very, very intrigued by a small little helicopter that was taking uh, shape in a corner of the seaplane hangar. And also, uh, at that time, Dad was beginning to seriously uh, consider dropping further flying boat work to concentrate on the helicopter. So I was hired. I actually built, would carve out of balsa wood, small helicopter models, and Dad would take them to the plant and uh, start talking to his engineers, trying to convince them that their next major project should be the helicopter. And uh, also, he asked me, and I did some sketches of future helicopters in various jobs. I would say that probably when I was 14, 15, I was already uh, doing a few drawings for Dad and doing one or two models for him that to take to the, uh, to the factory. To me, it was significant the fact that already by then, he had uh, discarded all other configurations and was already determined that the single main lifting rotor with small tail rotor would be the final solution to the helicopter. The beginning of the work in the plant started when the United States Army Air Corps decided that they would uh, publish a requirement for a vertical takeoff and landing machine. The Army Air Corps had played with the autogyro and at one time actually owned about 12 uh, Pitcairn machines. But uh, they, <clears throat> they got intrigued by the rumors of a highly successful helicopter, the Focke Achelis, the FA-61. And uh, they, they published a requirement Everybody took place, uh, took part in the uh, bidding. And I think as you m well know, uh, the, when the decision was made, uh, the army was swayed by the success of the German machine. And Platte LePage had a twin side-by-side -side rotor uh, project. And they were awarded uh, the first helicopter contract, which meant they got XR1. XR2, XR3 were two experimental jump takeoff autogyros. And it was then that Dad was already flying the VS300 that had been built as purely with company finance, not one penny of, of US government. And the aircraft, the VS-300, began to show such flight characteristics that the Army then uh, or gave Sikorsky an order for the XR-4. And that changed the whole game. And uh, I remember we finished the last of the big flying boats as the, as the uh, VS-300 was finished and as we were starting to cut metal on the first XR-4. This now 40, 1940 and 1941. At the plant, I was working uh, on a variety of jobs. Actually, uh, during the day, whenever there was a uh, test flight on the VS-300, I would help push the VS-300 out. I carried a great big 10-pound grease gun and I was in charge of greasing the main and tail rotor fittings. And uh, this was a unique experience because of the fact it allowed me to climb all over the VS-300 and get pretty well acquainted with the various control systems as they were being modified and changed. We had, at that time, no dedicated aircraft bearings that uh, could withstand centrifugal forces. Bearings take radial loads very well and keep grease very well. But when you put a bearing, say, in the hub of a main rotor, it'll, it'll keep gr grease this way, but the grease shoots out radially. 
and centrifugal force was such that after 15 or 20 minutes of flying, the helicopter sat down and my job was to wipe all the grease off that had been ejected from the main bearings and the tail rotor, uh, touch up a little bit of the grease and uh, then stand back. We were very, very, at that time, uh, impressed by a parade of visitors that would come. And our, when we wa uh, didn't like somebody, we would always say, you don't have to go back too far. You can stand up pretty close, very moderate rotor downwash. And sometimes that p person believed it, stood up fairly close when the helicopters took off and got himself a grease bath. <laughs> which was not very polite, but at that time we weren't very polite anyway. And uh, we warned all the people we liked to stand back at least 50 feet because the first 15 or 20 seconds, the radial, the centrifugal force squeezed all of the grease out of all of the bearings. But that was uh, part of the game. It was a period of time when, yes, primarily I worked on the VS-300 uh, cleaning it, servicing it, and uh, was involved in a tiny little shop where we were building the next generation helicopter. The XR4 was one project, and then a company finance project secondary was to build a small two-seat helicopter, which eventually became the S-52 after the end of World War II. The first test flights were obviously uh, done by dad, who got himself a kind of a feel of how the helicopter was flying. The, uh, the two Gluharov brothers, who were the, so to speak, the right-hand men of, uh, that dad had, also flew the VS-300. Then in due time, uh, primarily after the second configuration of the VS-300, it became stable enough to where dad would on t at times invite visiting uh, dignitaries, Charles Lindbergh, Les Morris, uh, to fly the machine. Les Morris was so much, so much impressed that he actually asked for him, eventually became uh, the chief test pilot. Uh, but there were other, as I say, half a dozen other people that uh, were flying the machine at, when it became a stable aircraft. Fall of 1943, I was drafted. I luckily was able to uh, be directed into the Coast Guard. The reason for that was that some six months to eight months earlier, the uh, question arose, did the U.S. Navy want to take part in the development work uh, that the United States Army Air Corps was doing on the helicopter? U.S. Navy said, hell no, we have no interest in the helicopter. It'll never be of any significance to Navy. Consequently, they said, uh, hand it over, and they designated the Coast Guard to be the re uh, research and development branch uh, to take the helicopter. That's when uh, Commander Frank Erickson uh, was nominated to be the first uh, commanding officer of a test and development squ uh, squadron. And he then went to Stratford and uh, Jimmy, no, uh, Les Morris taught, checked out uh, Commander Erickson and the number two pilot was uh, Stu Graham, who also uh, was uh, checked out on the helicopter. Those were the first Navy pilots. Uh, there were about four qualified Army Air Corps pilots. They set up a school. Frank Erickson set up a school in Floyd Bennett Field at the Coast Guard Air Station. And uh, I w was reassigned to this uh, Coast Guard School upon uh, surviving boot tra training, boot camp training. It was January, no, December of 1943.
that uh, I was assigned to Floyd Bennett Field. Incidentally, I was blo uh, blasted out of my bunk in January when that first episode, the Turner blowing up in uh, lower Manhattan Harbor and Frank Erickson flying in the face of weather that would that had grounded all commercial and military aircraft from Baltimore up to Boston. Heavy rain, freezing rain, marginal visibility, and the survivors from this exploded destroyer, the Turner, were being uh, rowed and motored ashore. And uh, Erickson, sometime around 8 o'clock in that morning, was uh, called and asked if it was possible to transport blood plasma. To take, it, to take it to this station in New Jersey was about a four hour drive by automobile. Erickson said, yeah, and uh, we fired up the 039, helicopter number 039, and uh, he flew in impossible weather feeling his way through the harbor, arrived in New Jersey, carried the blood plasma, saved several dozen lives as a result. And that was, I think, the first documented mercy mission by helicopter. And yes, I was there. On December 23, the night before uh, Christmas Eve, uh, <clears throat> State police called up and asked us if we could search the coast of Long Island and the, uh, <clears throat> the bays, the inlets that were on the ocean side of Long Island. Three kids were missing, uh, 16, I remember, 16, 12, and 10. <clears throat> They'd gone into uh, the uh, bay actually right now half filled, that's where JFK Airport is today. At that time it was all open swamp with tiny little hummocks with cattail grass on them. So the police asked us to check and I was on duty as a mechanic and uh, I'm trying to think of who it was but anyway one pilot and, and myself we took off. We we're finishing our uh, patrol when we noticed on one of the tiny little islands in the middle of the swamps there was a little bonfire burning and so we said gee maybe let's investigate that and we sat down about 50 feet away and I jumped out and walked over to this tiny little campfire that was burning there. There was a tent there, the two scared kids, frozen, stiff practically, and with faces streaked with tears. And next to the tent, the body of the oldest brother. And he had somehow been cleaning shotguns or something, and he had blown out his stomach with a, with a shotgun, was dead and very messy to look at. And these poor kids had already spent two nights out there on the island with, their, uh, with the body of their brother. And they were in pretty, pretty sad shape by then. And that was, I think, uh, well, we, uh, I stayed behind and the two kids were strapped into the co-pilot seat, to the side seat of the R4, flown to Floyd Bennett Field. And from there, the telephone coordinates as to about where the campfire was. And all I was interested in, frankly, was uh, either the police or the helicopter to come back. And both came back to the island about the same time. The police sent a boat out and they finally found the little campfire. And uh, the pilot found the island again and uh, I flew back. That was, I think, my first one. Then there were one or two hurricanes around there at that time in Long Island. And uh, we did a lot of observation, damage control, and damage assessment immediately 
after the hurricanes. It was all interesting work. And I stayed, well, I was pretty young, very recently married, no children. So the point system for uh, releasing people into the civilian life, uh, I was low priority, so I stayed in until about nine, March or April of 1946, when I was finally discharged. The military service to me was to see the development of the helicopter. I was very proud of the fact that it was uh, that I was involved in some of the very earliest design work on the rescue hoist, on the slings, on the various stretchers that were used. After I was discharged from the service, I tried to look around to get into college, but uh, all of the colleges were jammed, packed, and there were one and two and three year waiting periods to get into them. Then I got a letter from a friend who said he was studying on the GI Bill of Rights in Italy. And uh, in post-war Italy, the dollar was absolute king. And you could live quite adequately on $72 a month, uh, which was what we, uh, the GI Bill paid you. And uh, so I decided that I'd kill one or two years and uh, study in Italy. I studied art, history of art, and a little bit of architecture as well. Ended up by uh, being in an art class. It was interesting that I was also in uh, an a anatomy class taught by the chief surgeon at the uh, hospital in Florence. And we dissected cadavers to learn uh, anatomy. It was the last university in all of Europe that allowed that. But to me, after the initial shock, uh, it became fascinating. I darn near changed professions. And uh, darn uh, at the urging of a professor, I was seriously considering uh, taking up surgery, become a, a surgeon in the academy and go through the training. Decided later on that it was not quite the, what I wanted to do. I wanted to come back to the States. I didn't want to become a doctor in Italy. So I came back uh, after four years, graduated from the University of Florence, and came back to the United States with a, with a smattering of German, French, very fluent in Italian, and of course, uh, English. When I came back a couple of weeks later, I don't know quite how it happened, but I got a letter from uh, the president of United Aircraft Export, said uh, they'd like to talk to me, and uh, they liked, in due time, when I talked with them, they liked the fact that I had military service, they liked the fact that I'd been a mechanic on the helicopters, and they liked the fact that I spoke a number of European languages. And that's how I was hired for a one-year trial period. I guess I passed that trial period and uh, was then hired formally by United Aircraft and sent to Europe. I had a very, very uh, far-sighted boss in United Aircraft Export Corporation. And he said that uh, the German, uh, Germany would uh, eventually be uh, reabsorbed into Europe and eventually would become a powerhouse. And uh, he sent me to Germany and my job there was to identify the people that five to ten years later would be running Germany and running the various industries. And at the same time uh, I was, I carried a Pratt & Whitney hat out on occasions, helping market uh, Pratt & Whitney products to the various airlines and uh, covering, uh, so to speak, uh, Germany, Scandinavia, 
an on-call for places like Switzerland and Italy and, uh, and even uh, uh, going into uh, in the Near East, very preliminary work. But it was very interesting for a couple of years to work there and to meet some of the, uh, how should we put it, prominent industrial people, Germany, France, and uh, in Switzerland, and just getting a foundation, a very strong political industrial foundation in that period of time. In 1955, Germany became a member of NATO, and uh, it was very interesting because the Germans then decided that uh, they would follow the example of the United States, for instance, and have an organic army aviation as well as an air force and navy. And uh, they, they bought 21 H-34s, they bought 21 H-21s, they bought a half a dozen British machines and half a dozen French, and there was this terrific evaluation going on day by day between the various aircraft manufacturers to see who would land the major orders. Well, uh, we won the competition and the Germans then put in a, a follow-on order and eventually they had something like 146 H-34 helicopters. Why I was uh, assigned to stay in Germany to monitor the progress of the H-34s and make sure that, uh, that we performed as, uh, as the contract said and make sure that uh, Sikorsky ended up with a good reputation. It was, we did end up with a good enough reputation and step number two was then the German government uh, funding a new type of helicopter the S-64 Flying Crane. Not too many people know that the Flying Crane program actually was funded by the German government and not by the U.S. government. Began to get indications that uh, for one reason or another Russia was interested in uh, American technology. Boeing had some hopes of selling either 707s later 747s to Aeroflot. And we had uh, the hope of selling helicopters there. When I arrived in Russia, I began to feel this tremendously warm sympathy for Igor Sikorsky among the then Soviet aerospace industry. And the name opened a lot of doors and it gave me access to some people. There are or were wonderful friendships that were created despite the political situation. And for instance, I got to know the Yakovlev family quite well. And uh, Alexander Yakovlev had a son whose name also was Sergei. And that was a common point of contact. I became a very close friend of not only Mr. Mill, of, but also became a very personal friend of Marat Tishchenko, who would take over as the, uh, com uh, how should we put it, the leader, general designer, general manager of the mill after Mr. Mill himself passed away. There were also other people, uh, in the Soviet ministries that I got to know reasonably well. It was a very rewarding period of time. It was also a very interesting period of time because there was literally not one day. The day that I would land in Moscow, I knew that I was being followed. When I was in the hotel room, I knew that the phone was bugged and that probably there was a little camera somewhere photographing every single move that I made. Paris Air Show, I would say about 1957-58, the year after Gagarin had made the first flight, 
And I was in the uh, mill had brought in the 10K, the flying crane, the giant Russian flying crane. And we, uh, Mill and I were seated in, in the crane. And suddenly Mill jumped up and said, hey, Sergey, there's somebody here I want you to meet. And he jumped off the crane and brought this uh, chap in. And it was pretty easy to recognize the fact that it was Yuri Gagarin. And I remember Mill pulled out a bottle of vodka and some zakuski, some appetizers. And we proceeded, proceeded to drink the mandatory two or three shots of vodka. Then uh, Gagarin said, well, Sergei Igrevich, we were on that level. He said, Sergei Igrevich, why don't you come over here to the little uh, separate pavilion that had been created uh, for the Soviet aircraft industry. They didn't go into the main hallway or any of else. They built their own little house. And it was interesting to me. We walked up to the, uh, to the house and of course there were two or three security guards there and, and I just remember Gagarin without a, uh, any hesitation just telling the, the guards in very rough Russian, get, get that rabble out of here. I want to have a chance to visit with Mr. Sikorsky. And here are these guards that uh, emptied about 15 or 20 uh, Frenchmen, and I don't know what else, other people. And suddenly the doors close, and uh, he and I are alone in this, uh, in the Soviet pavilion. He led me to the uh, uh, <clears throat> Sputnik, to the actual space uh, capsule in which he had been flown and out and landed back, gave me some of the details, some of the scary stuff about re-entry when he was looking at the window and suddenly, whap, the outmost la layer of glass just disappears in a flash. And then second layer disappears about 10 seconds later. And he was lucky. Uh, the last three layers of glass held, and, but were badly, badly heated in the, in the process. He got down all right, and, uh, but it was a very interesting interview uh, on how you land uh, a space capsule. Gagarin, and of course, at that Paris air show, as it began, it became a very uh, wonderful chance to meet once again on neutral ground with some of the old Russian friends. I then became uh, a very close friendship with the then the legendary editor of Aviation Week, a gentleman named Bob Holtz. And Bob Holtz was uh, very much interested. He had evidently a great deal of uh, good uh, rapprochement, good handling ca characteristics with Sikorsky and with uh, United Aircraft, because I was given literally a uh, open end ticket that uh, I could spend one hour, max two hours, helping Bob Holtz trans and interpreting with the Russians. And to me, it was a very interesting period of time where you would go in. And the Russians knew Aviation Week, respected Aviation Week, and uh, were very outgoing in their data uh, to give the proper impression to Bob Holtz. And I would be the interpreter, learning quietly at the same time. It was a good period of time. The childhood liter uh, list was, I think, capped off by the Lindberghs, we play, as children, we played together quite often in a fairly large backyard. We had an eight acre backyard up in Long Hill, Connecticut, and uh, the Lindberghs were still suffering from the shock of the kidnap of their first child. They were very protective of their kids, but when they came to our home, that's when, the ki when we and the <clears throat> 
Lindbergh kids used to play in the backyards while Mama and Papa Lindbergh and Mama and Papa Sikorsky solved all the problems of the world. And later, it was, uh, yeah, a chance to meet people. Little vignettes, for instance, uh, a fellow named Corradino Dascanio, chief engineer of Piaggio. And after the end of the war, he's wandering through the bombed out factory and sees a tiny little warehouse that has been untouched in the warehouse several thousand tiny little 98 cc engines they were used as starter and you string pull them to start them and they would become the starter for the fighter aircraft that uh, piaggio was building and here is corradino who doesn't know what to do and so he decides to build himself a little motor scooter using one of those 98 cc engines highly successful little scooter, and he goes ahead and uh, shows it to his wife. She likes it, and she says, you know, you need a name for it. And it makes a buzzing sound like a bee, so let's call it the wasp. That was the birthplace of the Vespa. He never made much money as a chief engineer for Piaggio, but uh, he made a bundle after the war building the Vespa motor scooter. And there were other, fascinating meetings with Willy Messerschmitt and Kurt Tank, Professor Heinrich Focke, who came back out of Germany. And I remember a technical symposium in Germany where uh, you had a double header speaker program with Heinrich Focke and Igor Sikorsky. And I'll tell you that was a, it, Unbelievable. Also very interesting, the great respect and admiration that both men had mutually, one for the other. And it was just, just a wonderful experience to see these two giants sitting together and uh, chit-chatting in broken English and in broken German about the helicopters. My father was always very, very adamant whenever he was told that he was the father of the of the helicopter my father would insist no the father of the helicopter is professor henrik Focke, who built the very first practical machine capable of flying 250 miles capable of climbing to 11 and 12,000 feet of altitude and uh, endurances of two and a half and three and a half hours and he, dad, said he, Professor Focke, is the true father. That uh, maybe dad would grudgingly admit to the fact that he solved the challenge of the single main lifting rotor and a small anti-toke rotor. That solution, which he made with the VS-300, of course, is 95% of all helicopters in the world today are built uh, using the configuration that Igor Sikorsky uh, pioneered and made practical. But at any rate, there were a lot of other people, the Shah of Iran maybe years ago, uh, Prince Michel de Bourbon Parma, who I would understand <clears throat> if France were a monarchy, he would probably be the king of France. And there were other people and of course, Russia, you became, I would say, very good friends with uh, people such as Yakovlev, meeting Alex Tupolev, and Tupolev, the first thing that Tupolev says, are you married? Yes, sir, I am. How many brothers do you have? Three younger brothers. Are they married? Unfortunately, they're all married. And Tupolev turns to one of his assistants and says, damn it, what the hell am I gonna do with my two daughters? Eventually, they got married off to someone else. And, uh, yeah. And as I've already mentioned, Mill and Marat Tishchenko. At any rate, it was a very interesting bunch of people to meet. I came back, I think, sometime in May or June. And if I remember correctly, it was in October. 
that the United States Army announced the fact that uh, Sikorsky had been awarded the UTAS contract for what would eventually become the Black Hawk helicopter. And I remember that same evening after the announcement, a couple of friends and I from Sikorsky, we were seated together speculating and saying that, gee, you know, if we're lucky, uh, we'll build the roughly uh, 1,400 Blackhawks that the Army wanted, and maybe the Navy will come along and choose Sikorsky to build uh, the next version of the anti-submarine helicopter, and maybe we'll get a couple of hundred orders from Europe and the Far East. So we were actually speculating that possibly, with a great deal of luck, we would build 1,800, maybe 2,000 Blackhawks. And none of us, I think, in that little room speculating would realize that uh, well over 4,000 Blackhawks have been built to date. They're operating in, I think, now about nine, uh, 29 different countries. And it looks as if the Blackhawks will be uh, upgraded and improved in another couple of years with a new ver variant. So I would not be surprised to see that we will be building Black Hawks for at least another 25 years. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the total number of Black Hawks come up somewhere pretty close to 6,000, maybe just over 6,000 units. It's a unique machine right now. And the interesting thing is that, of course, people are using the Black Hawk in uh, missions that we, that certainly Dad never expected, and certainly many of us also never thought about. I retired from Sikorsky Aircraft, and uh, shortly thereafter was offered a uh, jo a contract as a consultant. And I'm very proud and very grateful that this association has continued uh, to this day. And I'm still, how should we put it, uh, still a part of the Sikorsky team and enjoying every minute of it. I can name a few that uh, are, I'm a <clears throat> honorary member of the HAI. I am also, I looked it up, believe it or not, that uh, I have a membership card from the American Helicopter Society dating to 1945, on the first year when it was organized. I have a number of De well, I would say one of the more significant degrees is uh, in aviation management from Embry-Riddle and uh, several medals from various societies. I would say probably 10, 12 decorations or honorary certificates. One advice, and which is paraphrased from some words of my father. If you have a dream, don't be afraid to follow it, because very often it's, you'll surprise yourself. <laughs>